Okay. Uh, again, welcome to everybody, and, and a, a great big thanks to uh, the Royal Oak Historical Society for asking me to come back and do a uh, additional uh, information, possibly about my family. But um, they they loved the whole idea, and so I've been away in Mexico, and I got this call to to come and do this talk, and I'd forgotten I'd promised to do it. To be quite honest with you, so in the interim. We've also bought a house in the last four days. We're moving, we're moving back to Victoria from Piers Island, just so you know. And if you're sitting there wondering, what's Gary got a beard for? No, I've never seen him in a beard. No, this is my first beard, I think. I think, is it my second, Stu? Stu would know. Um, somebody thought I was a new age hippie living on Piers Island, but uh, I'm not losing it, I don't think, no, no more than anybody else. And uh, I'm not going to a Santa Claus school. That, that's not the plan. Um, and as I say, we bought a townhouse in Saanichton. And it was quite fast. It happened all in about two and a half to three days. And so we're getting excited about moving back and fixing it all up and getting... Now I can come back to the meetings regularly instead of just getting here whenever I can. So what I decided to talk about today, and that, that was quite hard. I t briefly talked to Daryl about it. And uh, I'd already had something in mind um, I found it in a box of stuff that I had sitting there for years, and it involves um, about something about legends. And uh, we often talk about legends. And the gentleman in question, of course, is George McGee. Now, are, is there anybody here familiar with George McGee? Does anybody remember him? Somebody went to school with him. So, if you've been involved with the the horse club, yeah, that's right. Um, the guy that the guy that set me up for this years ago, and and he. He gave me a few notes and he said, add to it if you can. That was Claude Butler, the, the guy that everybody knew at Butler Brothers. And it, Claude always wanted to find a guy that would be a writer to do a book on George McGee. He said, because nobody would believe it. He did stuff, no, I, I've never seen a guy like him and I've never fired anybody more than I fired George McGee. I fired him at least five times for things he did. He didn't hurt anybody, he could have, but he didn't. And um, Things are just absolutely crazy. Um, the Legend of George McGee, a book by Claude Butler, he said. George worked for the Butler Butler family for a long period of time. He, he was a guy that had a really tough upbringing over off of Shelburne Street in McRae. Uh, he was one of, I believe, six children. He, he, um, his father left home when he, George was about 12, and uh, the whole family was very much on their own. And uh, his beginning wasn't very good. Uh, it, it was more of a disaster. He, he got into more trouble. He lost one of his twin brothers in a, an accident. He fell off a cliff up island. And it all related to liquor or beer or booze of some kind. And uh, the problems continually added on to the family's uh, adventures. In his younger years, George found a great deal of pleasure in horses. Now, if you remember what it was like over on... Sh anywhere, like just pick Shelburne Street. There were just fields. Now the shopping centers and housing and everything, but they, they would cut the fields at the airport down by, by the school um, and, and had family. And I was at one of the functions with when I, my, I first, I guess we were married for about a year, year and a half, and I was at a Christmas function. And um, I, I didn't ever, I just casually mentioned in conversation, does anybody here know George McGee? And there was this big uproar in the house. Three sisters, my wife's mother and her two sisters. George McGee, where the hell do you know him from? Uh, well, I've, I've met him, I, I've done work for butlers and I got to know him through butlers. He went to school with us, he was terrible. My mother-in-law gets up and she goes, see this mark on my chin? I go, yeah. See the scar? I go, yeah. What happened? George threw a bloody wheel off a barn and hit in the ground and smacked me right in the face. So we know George McGee, Betty, the Youngest sister said, oh, he, he would scare people. He'd always tell me, if I catch you, I'm going to kiss you. So I'd run like crazy. But, you know, she said he had the softest heart, and people didn't know this. Um, he was about eight years older than me, and he would often, because he lived down the street, he'd come by, and if I was playing by myself, he'd come and have play tea with me with a little tea set. So she said he wasn't all bad. Uh, people were a little scared of him at times. Um, if Halloween came around, you didn't know where your buggy, where your your uh, porch, where your swing, where it would be. It could be on the roof of the neighbor's house because George would put it up there at any time. He thought it was a great deal. He loved pranks. He never, ever stopped. This story that I, 
I uh, thought was quite humorous. It, I mean, it could have been a disaster. He was driving ready mix trucks for Butler's, and he was working out of Bay Street. And uh, he was told by the mechanics that, George, don't smoke in the truck. Don't light any matches because the gas tank's leaking, and the, the fumes are pretty. We haven't got time to fix it, but don't, don't uh, light any matches. So, uh, yeah, okay, he said. So he's heading into Bay Street, and it's lunchtime, so he goes to the colony. You guys all remember the colony? Well, he pulls in there for a burger and possibly a beer or two, and he's working, don't forget. And uh, he fired after he has lunch, he goes out, gets back in the ready mix truck, and he drives down. He's turning the corner on Bay Street, and the stoplight, I guess, is on, so he stops, and he pulls out the cigarette, puts the thing in his mouth, takes a mat, lights a mat, boom, he blows a windshield right out of the truck, onto the hood. That didn't break. He just pushed it back in the truck and drove to Bay Street. I get a call from Fred Greenhall. He was the foreman out in Keating, and he asked me if I had a moment to go down to Bay Street and reinstall a windshield, because George's windshield blew out of his truck before he could go out. He can't go out for another load until he gets the windshield in. So that was another time I met George McGee on one of his occasions. Um, George, of course, was an amazing driver. Like he could drive anything. It was just one of those guys that had great skills and he had huge strength. And on a Sunday, he'd been working on the on the day driving for Fred Ball. Now Fred Ball's a farrier or was a farrier. He's passed on now. And um, if anybody's had horses in the district, would have known Fred. And he had a great big van, big delivery van, that would hold about eight horses. So George had been picking up horses, delivering them to shows. And, you know, I suppose he, somebody would offer him a beer, too. And of course, he enjoyed that. So he was driving back home to Fred's place. Fred lived on V&S. So he's coming down the Keating Hill. He turns left on onto uh, Keating Crossroad, goes go up the hill. And he was a little bit wide with the trailer. There was no horses in it, but he was a bit wide with the trailer. And it went off the side of the road. And there used to be posts. Remember, he remembers it. Posts with little eyes in them so he could see them all the way up Keating. Well, he, he knocked the whole works out, flattened them all. But with his strength and his driving ability, he was able to keep this truck on the road. Well, he got to the top of the hill. He's driving down Keating, and he's thinking, now what do I do? I can't go to Fred's house. Everybody knows Fred, and it's Sunday, and I'm sure people have seen the truck. I mean, it's a big truck. What am I going to do? So he's, he's driving, and he keeps driving, and he drives right by Butler's, and he's, something is clicking in his head. He's thinking about this. So he goes down past the Mount Newton School. Now, at one time, you could drive up behind the gravel pit. So he goes into the left turn and drives up the, behind the gravel pit all the way up, parks beside this beautiful house up on top of the hill, goes inside, and, or inside the gate, knocks on the door. It's Claude Butler's house. Claude opens the door. And he says, uh, oh, George, you're just in time. My, wife, my, fav my wife's making her favorite food, grilled cheese sandwiches. Apparently, the, the wife, he said, wasn't a really good cook. This is what Claude said. But she was also the mayor of Central Sandwich of the time. So come on in. So George comes in. He spent the whole evening there. He stayed there until about 10 o'clock till it got dark. So Claude kept thinking to himself, why is he here? He doesn't usually visit. Why do he just all of a sudden pop up out of the blues? Well, he said to Claude, I had a bit of a problem. I came up to Keating Hill and I wiped up all these posts and I made a big mess and everybody, I'm sure, a lot of people saw me and they're still looking for me. But you know what? They'd never ever think of looking for me at the mayor's house, would they? <laughs> That's what George would do. And, uh, you know, things like that happen. Um, what Claude said, the stuff that he would do would just, wow, you know, how could the guy do it? But he was really strong. If you remember Brentwood, you were in Willis Point now, um, along all of the inlets in Brentwood and the areas, there were all ramps for ways, and you could take your boat up and do work on it. And once the bottoms are all painted, you had to kind of get it off. And you didn't want to jack up on the boat, quite honestly, jack it up. So you needed some way to lift the boat up to get the blocks out. And quite often, that was what George would do. He apparently would go over there, go underneath the boat, and just stand up with your boat on one end at a time, and you pull the blocks out. And that's how strong he was. That's why he could hang on to the steering wheel of that truck. 
and and quite honestly, he, you know, but he had a problem. He had a booze problem, and and the beer was it. I often remember the story that he told me one day. He was wasn't happy about it, but it happened. He was returning home from the Sydney liquor, the Sydney beer part. No, it was a it was a watering hole for all. I can tell you, twenty people that spent half their lives at the Sydney hotel drinking beer. And this story could have been a tragedy. Um, and to an RCMP officer, he was very, very lucky. Apparently, the RCMP officer had pulled a car over for speeding on the Patby Highway, just a little north of Her Hernando's Hideaway. Does anybody know where that is or was? It's a great question. It's a skill testing question that when I ask it, I get this blank look. Nobody goes, where? No, you're kidding. Well, there used to be a restaurant on the right side of the road going north just past Keating Crossroad, and it was called Hernando's Hideaway. It was there for years. You, you look it up, you'll find it. So this officer pulled George, or pulled the guy over for speeding. George was coming down the highway, heading south, and uh, he said he was kind of looking as he could see the lights flashing, and, and he said he, he looked ahead, and he, what he thought was, I wonder, I wonder if I could get my bumper just so close to that police car, I could peel the buffalo decal right off the truck, the car. Seriously, that's what he thought he could do. So what happened, the guy was writing the ticket, and the guy looked up and he said, oh my God, and the, the gentleman that had been pulled over and the RCMP officer jumped into the ditch as George went roaring by, put a little dent in the car at full length, and they picked him up at the end of Island View Road, of course, and he got arrested for that and got charged for impaired, and he lost his license for a while. But how do you tell that to somebody that would believe it? I mean, it could have been a disaster if he'd hit somebody. Now what would they do? I did, made a note here. Um, I said, Jack Mather has great stories from his timber cruising days up the BC coast. So if you're interested in timber cruising or what Jack Mather did up the coast, it's one of the stories he has told me over the years. And the last couple of days, I've had a, a couple of great meetings with Ed Gate, who worked with George. Now, I said to him, I said, um, can you tell me any stories about George McGee? Well, it took him five minutes to stop laughing. He said, stories? He said, well, he said, did you ever talk to Claude Butler? I said, yeah, I did. And he, he told me uh, quite a bit. Other people have told me. He said, well, I, w I worked at Butler's for eight years. And then he said, I started my apprenticeship working with George McGee. I said, well, how difficult was that? Well, I was scared. Like, you wouldn't believe how scared it was. Because what George drove was a cement buggy. Does anybody remember Butler's cement buggy? It's world famous. It was something that, I mean, the Butler family built that huge logging truck that you might remember that was built out at Sydney. Well, they also built, built they had no cement pumps. How do you get cement in, into, a, into a house or a construction job? So Ed said, well, I said, well, George, I, I don't know if I can do it. He said, ah, no problem, kid, get on. So it had a stick. Just, it didn't have a steering wheel, it just had a stick. So it worked by valves. It would, you'd pull a stick back and forth, and you could steer this monster. It had tractor tires, like four of them. And you could steer it. And you had maybe a inch on either side. What you would do is drive into the house, into the, where the garage door would be. Now, if you think of houses, they're all standard houses in the 60s and 50s. They were basically with a big garage door and garage. You would drive drive your, you know, and what he told me, he said, look, what you do is you put the ra you look right behind the radiator cap, I line that up with something, and just drive in. And he said it worked. I got onto it really well, and that was my job. George went to drive a bulk truck for Butler's. That was, the bulk truck took all the, the cement from different areas that they get at Lafarge and Victoria, and they'd take it to all their particular sites where their, their concrete plants were. And what happened to Ed, he said one day, I come back to Butler's and it, I was driving, it was like in November, I was frozen. And they wouldn't haul it on a machine, they'd drive it. So I drive it back to Butler's, I get, and my, I'm just shaking, I'm freezing, I'm shaking, and George is there cleaning out his truck, and he said, oh, no problem, because eventually George moved down beside where we lived in Brambwood on Benvenuto, he had a big old house down there, and they'd had all kinds of parties there, and he took me down there, and he lit the fire, and he said, take your boots off, Ed. So Ed said, okay, he takes his boots off, and George pours him a drink, and Ed's drinking, and uh, he said, well, you're going to get warm in a minute once this fire goes. Take your boots off. So he said, I'm looking at the fire, and then I go, what the hell is that? 
George has put my boots in the fire. And he said, why are my boots in the fire? Oh, and he said, you need to get warm, don't you? And he goes, well, no, don't burn my boots up. He says, don't worry, I have a new pair sitting beside you. So that's what he would do. He gave him a brand new pair of boots. And so Ed said, what do you do with a guy? He gets you warm. He, he's looking after you. Then, and then I said, well, what about the fire? It's going to go out. No problem. He goes outside, gets a chainsaw, comes in, and cuts the banister off. <laughs> and cuts chunks of it all the way. Cut the whole banister off. So I, I, I said to Ed just the other day, I said, how many cords can you get out of a banister? He said, I don't know. But he would do that. And um, he'd have stories where he'd have big parties there, and he'd bring a log with a tractor in the window into the fireplace, and as the log burnt, he just kept pushing it into the fireplace. I know that's hard to believe, but there were guys that, that saw that. And Ed said, but the funniest story that he thought of was when Butler's, the drivers, joined the union. It's always a problem when you, when you join unions, but the union representative had a big fancy house in Victoria in, near the uplands, and he invited all of the staff, all the truck drivers, after work to come in for a bit of a party. And George is one of the last ones to get there, and, and he's been working in the construction all day, so he was, you know, he was a mess. So he just said uh, to the lady, is there anywhere I can get washed up? So she says, well, you can go upstairs to the, the bathroom. There's everything there. You can get washed up. So I, I guess she assumed he had other clothes, but obviously she didn't pay attention. So what George did, he went in, got put, run the bath, jumped into the bath. <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard this story, but he came out of the bath. He walked out of the bathroom with a towel on his arm and nothing else. He just walked right like it was a normal thing, down the, down the stairs, and here I am. Where's the party? And, and you know, that's, that's the kind of a guy who was uh, uh, naked with a towel. And as Steve Butler said, my dad said, oh, that's just George. And uh, what's, what do you mean, that's just George? Well, I heard this horrible sound coming down Keating Crossroad. And when I talked Earlier, a few years ago, five years ago, I mentioned how we made rafts out of telephone poles. George would grab a telephone pole that had been taken down by the phone company, and he would hook a cable onto it, and he'd tow it to his house in Brentwood, down Keating Crossroad in Benvenuto. You can imagine the noise it would make swinging back and forth. And that was quite common. They just assumed it was George on his normal trip. He was taking telephone poles to his house, so he'd just tow it down the road. Um, when anybody uh, thinks of George, they always go, God, I wonder what happened to him. Well, he finally died. He died, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the date, but he died of cancer, and he died basically alone. But um, he had throat cancer. He smoked like a chimney. And uh, he had all other things. The thing that he had that drove people crazy, they never thought he'd come around with that. When he was suspended on one of his cases, people would often go to dances and when you talk about dances in the old communities here, the community halls were really famous for dances. I mean, nobody goes to dances anymore because it's just it's the way it is. Nobody wants to and nobody can. But uh, this particular time, George license had been suspended, so what he did was took his horse to the dance. It was it Saanich? And everybody felt sorry for George's horse because he was tied up outside um, by the hall. So they went out and they... Somebody put something, a hat or something, and they put beer in it and gave it to the horse. So George, George apparently didn't know what was going on. He was having a great time at the dance, so he's heading back home. And John Gellings was the police chief for Central Saanich at this time. And John's at the shop one day, and he says to me, you won't believe what we did the other night. I go, what happened? He said, well, we get a phone call that there's a disturbance on Wallace Drive. So what the hell is that, he said. So we, we, the two of us go out, we go down, and here off the Wallace Drive, the ditches are quite deep. If you're going toward Brentwood, they're not as deep, but on the, other, the left side of the road, they're really deep. Luckily, they weren't that deep. They're deep enough. George's horse walked into the ditch. And so George is standing up on the top of the road with the reins and the rope in his hand, trying to get the horse to come out. And when the police arrive, he just says, it's not me this time, it's the damn horse, it's drunk. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if you write or tell a story like that, did it really happen? John Gelling said, yeah, it happened. I was there, I saw it, it was crazy. I mean, you just, just never knew what, uh, 
would happen if George McGee was involved, but it would always be entertaining. So that was the story of George McGee. What, I've, what I'd like to tell you now a little bit about is because I know some of you are, um, I'm, as I said, I'd, I'd like to do a bit of history about well, just everything, but one of the questions I was asked, I'm not sure who it was, if it was here or not, was what's it like to downsize? What's it like to move away? And so I, near the end of my stuff, I thought, oh, hell, that's, that's not that bad. It's, 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 it's hell, but you have to do it. it. When I was asking people, most people start to sputter. I said, are you downsizing yet? Because you're getting up there with age, you know, and they go, oh, well, I'm thinking about it. That's often the case I hear. And they look, have panic is on their face. I'm working on it. And, uh, well, make a decision. It, it's not easy. It really is not easy. Most people have bigger houses filled with stuff. And I mean, lots of stuff. We all know about that. What can you do to take to your new place? Well, will it fit in your new space? Probably not. It's probably too big. Uh, it's not the right color. You've had it for 25 years because after a certain period of time, you don't buy new stuff. That's comfortable. It's okay. Uh, uh, did your parents give you any of this stuff? Maybe they did. Quite often they did. Um, when, when you tell, they tell me, oh, my mother has a, a set of dishes. They're unbelievable. It has gold, 14, 14 karat gold around the outside edge of everything. I think it, she says it was worth about $6,000. And I, I try to tell them, well, it's not really worth very much money, but I don't want to break their, their dream. I just still want to do that. So I, I, I just say to them quite simply, phone one of the stores on Fort Street, the people that sell that on consignment, and they'll tell you the value. They, they probably will tell you the value has dropped to zero. They won't tell you immediately, but they say, well, maybe if it's exceptional, maybe we just want to leave it there for a, a few days and we'll see what happens. And so you leave it there, and maybe you'll get $50 for it. But that's what's going to happen when you downsize. The biggest thing is that your kids don't want it because it's not dishwasher safe. They can't put it in the dishwasher. It might write on some of this stuff, yes. right? Microwave. Yeah, microwave. Uh, and the, and the, most, uh, the housing market has really changed. It has changed considerably in the last six months, or well, say a, a, a year. Um, my son's in real estate, and he said it, it's come down. It, it's come down. Certain things haven't, um, but in generally, generally they, it has. Now, the thing is that most of us, I don't know how many here have got great big company pensions, but I don't know, I don't think that's the norm today. Um, if you don't have a big government pension or other, other pensions other than the government one, uh, the house you live in is probably going to be your biggest asset. So you have to try to sell that and then try to, and that's what we've been doing, take that house and move it over here and try to figure out what you can deal with in a budget. How long, if you're 80, how much more time do you have? You have to be logic, realistic about it. it. As one guy said to me, it might be just as easy to rent a house because you might only live for three more years and you don't have to go through this drama of getting rid of it. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's, that is a, that's a really good point. Some people have got, been smart enough to buy uh, property that gives them rental uh, money and uh, um, that, that's, and don't get sucked into putting it in a storage unit. You know, I'll keep it, and I'm the best example of doing that, and just my wife going, I told you, I told you a hundred times, what you put in that thing in the first year or the second year, it isn't worth half of what you're going to get what you got in if you sell it. You can't even give it away. And what you, that's what you end up doing. Oh, hell, just take it. I don't want it. I just don't want to live with that damn thing anymore. It's driving me crazy. And uh, I've done that so many times. Um, it took us a year to get rid of a 10 by 10 storage unit in Keating when we first sold the house. Because, oh, what do we do with all this stuff? Well, we, we gave all the basement to, to friends, uh, young kids that need to start. And I said, oh, just come get it. We don't, we're not going to, it's not worth the drama. And uh, we made the move, as I said to you, we moved to Piers Island. And uh, we thought, well, we'll take a year off, which we did. We took two and a half years off to be honest. And a, a few months ago, we were packing our, our groceries up the ramp to the house. Now, the gates here are from Piers Island, too. I know 
the same story that they have. It, it becomes a chore. It's not bad when you're 30. No, you can go out and conquer the world, cut all the trees down, clean up. You, can, you have endless amounts of energy, but when you get 80 and above, your energy level, it kind of diminishes, and uh, it becomes a problem. Our house that we had in Brentwood Bay uh, had a beautiful garden that was huge, way bigger than we ever expected to build, but it was a maintenance. It was just horrible for maintenance. Never stopped, 24-7. People would say, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm working on the garden. Well, you were working on that last week. I said, I know, I work on it every day. You have to, because you have to. If you don't look after it, it, it the value just, it just goes down. Did we buy on Pierce originally? No, we did not. Uh, we were very fortunate that our, our daughter and her husband's, their family had a place and they inherited, uh, her husband inherited half of it and her sister inherited the other half, but then the sister didn't want it, so they bought it out. And then the neighbor, who was a good friend of theirs, said, well, I'm not doing well, you better buy my house. So they gave them a read, and that's where we moved in. We had, it's about 1,100 square foot house. We went from 4,500 to 1,100. <coughs> that's a big difference. But you're on Pierce Island, you're in the jungle, you're, you're way in the forest, you're not at Willis Point, you're not at Cowichan, or way up in the boonies. But you have a different life. Um, Piers Island is great. It's, um, it's really horrible. You have to live on the waterfront. Isn't that awful? Uh, we're on, right. But it comes with the consequences. It comes with winds that blow your dock down. It comes with trees that fall over. And somebody else here lost, uh, one of the winters lost something with, with the winds. It's been bad. It's been a bad winter for everybody. Uh, Piers Island, if you have not been there, it was used originally from 1936 to 33 to 36 for the Duke you know, Do we all remember the Duke of burning plate houses, taking all their clothes off the women and standing around having a hot dog roast or something? I don't know, but they ended up on Piers Island, so it was a, a Duke of uh, uh, not a retreat, but it was kind of like a prison for them. You, you have to take all your groceries over. You, you don't have a store. That's part of the stipulation. You're not allowed to build a store over there. But the people are, <clears throat> are just super. They're, um, they're the kind of people that you maybe hear about, um, very crafty people in some cases, with all kinds of, of um, mentionable degrees. We had one guy that won the Order of Canada that lived over there, and he was a guy that uh, developed the, when a baby is born, they, put stuff in the eyes of a baby so it doesn't go blind. Well, he developed that, and he kept SARS out of Canada. So he, for all that, he won the Order of Canada. He lived there, and he still does. But he's got heart problems. He's walking the island twice a day to keep everything working. But uh, he, he said, I, I'd move off the island, but where the hell do I go? I got this amazing, unbelievable house over there. He said, I shouldn't have put all my money in my house, but I did. And, uh, and other people have uh, done that. Uh, Bob Jordan, Mary Jordan, they're on the point. <clears throat> I saw him when we went, came back last time, and he was, he, he's had some bad health problems. Anyways, I said, Bob, how's it going? He goes, I had bloody groceries. He said, I hate it. I said, but he's, he, this house is amazing. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous, right on the point, got a big dock. He sees the ferries go by all the time. He said, I get out of here, but I can't talk my wife into it. She's an artist. She's got all her reason out of health. And uh, she said, nah, I'm not, I'm not interested in moving. So what type of house do you, uh, do you buy? <clears throat> do you buy a small house when you downsize? Or do you buy a condo, a townhouse? And it takes a lot of time to figure it out. What can you afford? That's, that's the criteria. And how much money do you want to invest? As I say, if you're 80, how much longer will you live? And how is your health? Can you still handle stairs? How you, Peter said, my knees are terrible. So I don't know how many stairs. You know, every time you climb a set of stairs, you think, oh, Jesus, why do we put these stairs in? So <clears throat> excuse me, that's, that's one of the things that we were really concerned about. My wife was. She said, what the hell am I going to do with you? I don't want to pack you up the stairs. You better be able to get those stairs by yourself or you're out of here. So what we found was a place with no stairs. It's all one level, and uh, it, it, if you have a box of goods and what good things or bad things, what I don't want, then we didn't hit many I don't wants, which was, that was probably the biggest problem, figuring that out. 
So I just hope that helps some of you. Somebody else had asked me earlier, have you got any suggestions when you downsize? I said, not really. It's just, it's just one of those things. You, uh, you do it. I brought a couple of pictures today. Um, this one here, the streetcar tracks are not there. You can come have a look at this later. I'll, I won't hold it up, Daryl, but you can see here. What it is, it's the corner of Yates and Douglas. The streetcars used to run through there. When I was a kid, I was born in 39, so when I was a kid, streetcars were everywhere in Victoria. I had a har I was such a monster kid. Um, you remember the harnesses put on your kid? Yeah, giant leash, yeah. Leather. And uh, my mother said, I don't want, you're going to run out in the middle of traffic. You're so, you're out of control. You have to be slowed up. So that's what I have. But what I would do apparently, I'd walk across and I'd sit right in the middle of that street when the lights would change. You could, because when the lights go all green, you can walk and crisscross anywhere, right? I'd sit in the middle of that street. I don't, I'm trying to think of, do I remember that? I said, no, I don't. But I did it a couple of times and then finally my mother said, that's enough. No more for this little monster. So one day she just shortened up on the strap and whipped my ass right across the street to the next side. And people are coming up behind her going, you can't do that. She said, he's not sitting in the middle of a streetcar track. I don't care what you say. It's not your kid. And you know what she must have said to him. <laughs> I'm just, I'm cleaning it up because I really don't know what she said. Um, and, and that is some of the stuff. When, when I talk about sometimes for interest for people, how things have changed, not only out in this area. Look how things have changed. Um, my son was asking me the other day, where, the, where did the highway go? And, and how did, where did it go by Grandpa's place? So I got a, he, like he's 60 almost. We've been married 60 years. And I said, well, it went down here. And he goes, oh, I didn't know. I said, well, I must have told you. But he does not remember. So I kind of took him. We went for a bit of a drive, and we drove the old highway as much as we could find um, from Royal Oak past Beaver Lake and down past the, where the Black Swan would be because it basically followed that route and then past Mathers and Polly Blanks, and then it would go around the corner by Mr. Pease's and the Toby Jug up past my dad and, and the Elk Bay Auto Court as it headed north, and then it would cross the highway. I found it amazing. When I tell that to people, I go, well, I can't see it on the highway. Well, yeah, you can. If you go past my parents' garage, you'll see the road. There's a big blasted rock, and there's a highway. There's a turnaround there now. But that used to go right through and around and up the corner, and then follow that and go down. And, and the old highway is still, as you go down past for Miles Hill, it's still off on the left. And then you pick up the East Sandwich Road and go. I said, you go right through the middle of the airport, past Mary's Cafe. And he goes, Really? I go, yeah. I mean, that's what it did. And, but they don't have a clue. This picture here shows what it was like. At, and then Daryl's family, Daryl has got great film on his, his uh, uncle, I think with his Model T, driving in Victoria. And you can see the city hall. And he goes down to these docks. That I, this is the, the CPR docks in front of the Empress. You can come have a look at, that, at this later. Um, the old ferry that went across from 1905 to 1955 to 1960 to Port Angeles. The docks down here, they, the signage tells you Vancouver, Seattle, or Port Angeles. And it's quite simple. But if you go down there now, young kids today, there's no way that they would ever think of or what it would look like. And, and, and I, what I'm trying to do is, do you remember? Does it, does it kindle your memory a little bit? And what, you know, what happened in Victoria in the early years? What happened in Victoria from, say, 1882 until 1964? I, I kind of picked a number, not that 1882 is a big number for everybody, but um, this is the 1882 one. When I was driving a bus, I always got great amount of interest in this parrot. You remember Lewis the parrot? You remember that? Um, I'm not going to read all of that. I, I'd like you to come up and, and read this, but it was a gift to, uh, to Mary on her in 1882. And of course, uh, it, was, it was, pardon me, Jane Wilson, and it was a gift by her father. And the parrot lived to 115 years of age. 
it just tells you a bit of a story why and how it took so long for them to develop the Chateau Victoria property and where the if you've never if you've been to the Chateau Victoria's Paradise restaurant this is where the name came from and it, it was in uh, national magazines the Mahdi and um, Mahdi was actually Mahdi it wasn't Lewis at the end and that was something that they found out at the last, latter part of its life so um, another bit of a story about that um, and who was the first pe person to swim the Straits of Juan de Fuca? Does anyone... Marilyn, Bell. Marilyn Bell was the first woman. You're right, woman, but not the first person. It was Bert Thomas. Yeah, Bert Thomas was from Tacoma. Stu, didn't you swim that, Stu? No. No, not yet. Okay, you're working on it, right? Um, where did it go? This is not a quiz, it's just, I'm, I'm trying, uh, what I, the last few days, other people say, well, I don't know about this, I don't know about that. Uh, and I mentioned, I told you about Piers Island, about it being it for the Duke of Ours, but do you, did you ever remember hearing about the big sea serpent in Cabra Bay? Right? And I, when I read this, I got, I thought, wow. It's, I, I thought it just happened in, in my time, in the 50s, but it didn't. It was first spotted in 1933. So what I'm thinking, Somebody must have found this article and said, wow, why don't we start this rumor again? I, I mean, do we believe it or not? I don't, nobody that I talk to believes it. But in 33, if you saw it off Trial Island, you weren't always going to tell somebody because you didn't want anybody thinking, oh, there's a bit of a nutcase there. They didn't really see it. Um, and then Czech Television was born in 1956. And does anybody remember who the lady was that was the favorite female talk? Clarkson. Ida Clarkson. Okay, you got that? And we, we got uh, our first BC flower in uh, 1956. It was a doglet, right. And the Victor Victoria Ties won a baseball title in, in 1952. Uh, this is worldwide. Mount, the mountain climbers conquered Mount Everest in 1953. Remember that? And Queen Elizabeth's coronation was in 1953 as well. Now. If you remember that, you're over 45, right? <laughs> you're, now, here's one. I, this was really funny, and I, I wondered. The Tillicum Outdoor Theater opened in 1951. Now, did anybody break a side window for, to, when they forgot to remove the speaker? <laughs> How many will admit to that? No? Nobody's going to admit <laughs> And in intermission, I always thought the intermission was cool. Because um, that guy would come on for 10 minutes and he'd be eating something every minute. Remember the clocks going around and around? And that was all. Um, and have you ever been in the trunk of a car so you didn't have to pay? No? It, nobody would miss to that. That was quite a common occurrence. Because um, nobody made any money in those days. Were you in the trunk of a car? No, I wasn't in the trunk of a car, but my girlfriend that lived right next door, Bonnie, wasn't her, your, your aunt, yeah. 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 And Linda used to pop popcorn, and we would go to the outdoor with right. a great big huge bag of already popped popcorn and ginger beer and beer bottles and sit there and think that. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about the Tillicum Outdoor Theater, as I said to one guy, I said, these are the times you don't really tell your kids all about it, because it's a good thing it's not at Tillicum Outdoor Theater anymore. Not that that really matters, but um, at your age now, you cannot say what you did while you were there, okay? So seriously, nobody's human in this room, but, you know, that's just another one of those little stories. Uh, and Ripple Rock, of course, was blasted to smithereens in 1958. I, I didn't think it was... I got, we got married in 59. It was a year before that. Now, the BC Ferry Service started in 1960. The cost was $5 a vehicle plus $2 per, per person. So it's changed. And the Dees Island or George Massey Tunnel opened in 1959. And I, I was thinking of Daryl because he showed me pictures one day at his, at his house. Um, it says, no more beach parking at Beaver Lake Park. So Daryl showed me a whole bunch of pictures he'd taken at the Beaver Lake Park. So I thought, well, you can't park there anymore, Daryl. And this was kind of not shocking, but um, the First Nations people didn't get the, the right to vote until 1960 in any election, which was, and this is one I asked Daryl's wife the other day and I was over for a moment. Do you remember 
where you were when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And she, boom, she had the answer like that, just like that. And of course, Don and I can, re can relate to this when the tidal wave sweeps up the Alberni Inlet. Now, that, that, was, that was sad for the people that were there, but uh, we got a call from Don, my wife and I, and Ron, I think. No, Ron didn't go. Um, he wanted to know if we could come up and come up with him. <clears throat> His uh, uncle had an auto court on the, on the inlet. He could come up and help them kind of get things together. So we went up there, and uh, there was no way. There was just, there was no auto court, nothing. There was, and, uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it just shows you what can happen. I mean, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and to be able to go there, uh, I thought, because you couldn't get in because the army were there, and unless you had relatives or something, you weren't allowed into the area. But uh, we did. Um, I'm trying to remember how you said Sergei Yassin and the Queen of Victoria collided in, in, in the Narrows with the BC Ferry. Do you remember when it sli almost sliced the Queen of Victoria in half? Yeah, three people died in that accident. Yeah, and <clears throat> back to Daryl. David Foster, his relation, has his first hit with Skylark in 1972. So you, you just never know. And Wayne Gresky came to Victoria in the 70s with the uh, LA Kings and played in the Memorial Arena. And that was a lot of fun for everybody. The Memorial Arena, I thought, was quite an amazing building. It was the f first first major construction after the Second World War in Victoria Memorial Arena. And it started in 1946, and they didn't get into it till 1949. They, the big barrel roof, that was, that was quite a thing. The, the estimate for the price, uh, four times as much, $1.2 million to complete the cost of the Memorial Arena. Now, when I was reading about this the other day, I, my, I said to my wife, what do you remember about the Memorial Arena? Oh, definitely the rock and rolls. Definitely that. Every Friday night, that was her thing, was going to the rock and rolls. If you ask guys that, it's the hot dogs. Definitely the hot dogs and the onions, right? And I'm sure many of you... Um, have been there and, and seen all of the things that are going on uh, and how things have changed. When did you think they shut the Memorial Arena down? It's just a crazy guess. It blew my mind. 1992. That's when they shut it down. And that doesn't seem like that long ago, does it? <laughs> and that's, that's, I guess, what I'm trying to relate to is um, the time, you know, how fast the time's going and, and, and what do we do? You know, and there's things we can't do anymore because we waited too long. Our our bodies won't let us do it. But is, can I answer any questions? Yeah, for, why don't you have a cell phone? Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. I almost forgot that. Um, that's often the question I get asked to me. Why don't you have a cell phone? Oh, well, I've had cell phones, quite honestly. And uh, because of now, Stu probably has the same problem. But I don't, have you got a flip phone still, Stu? No. You have a cell phone? Good. See, we're in the same track. What has happened with because of our both of our occupations, we don't have any skin on our fingers. So we're, our fingers, we the phone, we don't. We need a, a guess, a dabber or something, but we can't make it work. And for years, I would be trying to use it, and it would drive me crazy. My wife would well, quit hitting it. I said, well, I try this. I try her tablet. You know, we just you're pushing too hard. Okay. Well, you're not pushing hard enough. It doesn't matter what we do. The guy, I finally got a guy that explained it to me. He said, he said, come and see me when you want a phone. And I'll go with you and we'll get you a phone. <clears throat> but you're not designed at, at this moment for a telephone. I said, okay, now that's better. Why didn't you tell me that a long time ago? Well, you never asked, okay? So many of my friends will say, have you got a phone yet? I go, no, God, everywhere you go, everybody comes in the room. They don't care about you. They're, oh, hi, how are you? That's all you see. <laughs> That's all they do. They don't care. I know you have to have it. I mean, you really, and the kids, I mean, they, their world is on their phone. But guys like me and Stu, Stu doesn't have one. I don't have one. The reason I don't have one is I keep trying. My wife would always get a phone every two or three years. I got a new phone. I go, oh, good, and that's good. And um, they're giving me a second phone. You can have it. Maybe you'll have better luck with this one. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know. I said, that I, I, I don't think it's going to work. She goes, well, you don't try hard enough. I, I try. I try everything. I'm out in the Chosen at Lloyd Stromkin's place one time. And uh, Lloyd goes, how are you making out with your phone? I said, ah, it doesn't work. So he's, he's really good with his phone. He goes, well, mine works. I goes, well, you got an Apple. It's probably a better phone. What do you got? So he, I show it to him. Oh, I've never seen that before. Well, my wife gave it to me. It's one that she gets given to her, free. She buy, gets a good phone, free one goes to me. So he said, well, my friend's coming out. He's a techie from Dockyard. Oh, yeah, he's really good with all that stuff. He'll fix it for you. He'll figure you out. So he comes in about an hour later, and he calls over, and he says, hey, come here and have a look at this phone. Goes, What's wrong with it? It's his phone. It doesn't work. So he takes it. He looks at it. He takes the back off it. What's wrong with it? I said, oh, if you, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. And, you know, I do everything. I, I get the wrong people, and everything is bad. So he just give it to me. He goes outside with it. He goes through a whole 10 minutes of mucking around with it. He comes in, he goes, you're right. He says, it's a piece of junk. So what do, you, what do I do with it? Get rid of it. Throw it in the garbage. Just take it and throw it away. So, okay. <clears throat> I'm on Piers Island. It's a few months later I'm on Piers Island. I keep trying to get the phone to work. It doesn't work, on and off. And uh, I'd had it with the phone. It, I couldn't get anybody this day. It, it'd ring and I couldn't get it. And so I could text the odd time. I had been texting the Steve Butler. So I text to Steve Butler and I said, Steve, this is the last message this phone's going to give anybody. I've had it. And I sent it off. Doom. So then I took it and I went out to the little shop we had. The Frank there had an old uh, railway tie in the corner. So I pulled it out, put the phone on it. Got, I went and got a big hammer out of my toolbox. And, well, fire it in the cra Amazing that glass didn't stand up, just broke. <laughs> So I just gently picked it up, felt really good, walked over to the, now we're on the, on the, so I just threw it like that, about 50 feet out in the water, splash. So people would phone, I'm phoning you, it doesn't, nobody answers. I said, no, nobody will answer. Did you leave a message? Yeah, I left a message, but you didn't phone me back. Okay, you know what, the best thing about my phone is I never have to plug it in, and I know where it is. <laughs> That's the best thing about the phone. But they're going to, see, you can do it too, Stu. You, you can do the same, the same thing. So those, those are things that you can do with, with a cell phone. Does anybody here remember who they have seen or went to see at the Memorial Arena as far as an entertainer is concerned? Crash, crowd. Do you? Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash, he was there. Yeah. Oh, really? The, on the front, yeah, I mean, depending on your age and what you're in at that time, the Doobly, Bro Doobly Brothers, yeah. they played there. Um, Spike Jones, Daryl, remember Spike Everly Jones? Brothers. Big pardon? Everly. Everly Brothers were there. I had a whole list, and I honestly don't know where I left it. But there's, the, the book I'd found, they had about a dozen people that have, that have played there. Gracie Fields, apparently, has played there. Tiny Tim played there. Jason Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that, that, I guess, in so many ways is the, is the theory of, uh, of what's gone on. I, I was trying to find some more stories on my mother because I know uh, a lot of people love the stories about my mother because she was uh, kind of one of a kind. Was, uh, she was different. There was no doubt of that. And apparently, I, I guess I'm a little different. Oh, we all are. We, have, we all have our own drummers, so, you know, it uh, doesn't really matter. Big pardon? Skating at the arena. That was a big thing. My, as I say, my wife was into the rock and roll dances. And she said skating too, but if she had to pick between the rock and roll, it would be that. Uh, J.C. Fair. Does anybody remember going to J.C. Fair? Remember doing that? Um, yeah. Who's saying, I'm falling in love again? What was Bob? No. I can't remember the name of the, the entertainer that, that sang that. But... There's scads of entertainers that have been in Victoria. And now, of course, the new breed is here. Um, did anybody, has anybody seen, did you go to see Cher when she was here at the new arena? No? No? See? No, I'm saying, what is it? No? No? Excuse me. No? Excuse me. That's, that's how it goes, you know. It, it, you, you, you sort of plateau out at different levels, I suppose, and then it, it kind of ends there. Any more questions that we can ask? Answer. Who is Frank? Who is this? That I don't know. I don't know. I, I, um, 
I had, as I say, I had some of these stories, and uh, I had a couple other. I was supposed to try to get a hold of Mort Robinson too, Shirley's brother, who worked at, at Butler's his whole career with other than the Okay. Well, it could be. Yeah, it could be. That I don't know. Jerry, did you hear the story of George McGee when the gravel truck went over into where Maddox uh, golf course is there? Yeah, that, yeah, I was there when it was uh, when the truck bent. The train bent like this. It was he driving? No, he wasn't, but uh, they got the biggest wrecker from Super Service. I yeah. Think. Yeah. With a ready mix and put some gravel in it. Yeah. And guess who the driver was? George McGee. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember that. I was there, Don. Anyway, uh, George McGee was sitting there, and I think he was smoking, and then all of a sudden he got pretty ticked off waiting so long, and you could just hear, boom, boom, and he pulled the wrecker and the gravel truck <laughs> right know. out. I know, I know. It just amazing stories. I, I, it's too bad Claude Butler. Um, didn't live long enough to. Well, to one time he stopped for lunch or coffee or a beer. Yeah. And turned his truck on. And he had to get in and chip all the cement. Oh, I can. That's right. That I didn't tell you that story. I. Okay. That's the story I didn't. Nah. They were building bridge embutments in Souk. No. Uh, no, they were probably 18 miles up from the the bottom of at the river or at the, by the river and the ocean. And the butlers had tractor trailer units ready mix trucks and they would haul like I guess 10 12 yards of concrete and uh, George was driving because he he was his driving skills and so he that was his job to drive one of those trucks and he, he was told to put extra uh, take extra calcimine with him which hardens the concrete a lot quicker put it in when you get at the site and then spin it around, it'll mix, and then pour it into the bridge above. So I, whether George forgot, he put it in at the bottom of the hill. Now it's, it's 20 miles up these hills. Now the, <laughs> in those days, the pumps that turned the drums were on the front of the trucks, and the big long hoses running to the back. So. If you turn the pump on, you lost a lot of power in the motor because it took a lot of, especially going up a hill. So George <clears throat> shut the pump off. He drove 20 miles from this level to the, to the site, got to the site, pulled up, and, he, and the guy said, turn, it, turn on the ready mix truck, George, spin the drum. So he goes to the back, turns the drum, and the concrete had hardened, and the whole truck went, all the wheels came off the ground. Like this, he almost tipped it over. That upset Claude. Claude fired him on that one because he was told not to do it again. And uh, what they did was they brought it back, and they and George got into that with a jackhammer, and he had to bust all the concrete out of that for nothing. He they wouldn't pay him to do it. And then uh, two weeks later, they hired him back because they really needed him. <laughs> so. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I don't, I don't think, I, maybe that's one of my pages. I, I paper everywhere at, at my daughter's house today. So, any other questions for you, Daryl? No? No, okay. Anybody else got anything to say? I was, I, I know. Um, I talked, Ed Gates said yesterday, it, he, his truck wasn't there when I went by. And he, Ed had seen him a couple of weeks ago, and he said he had to pound it like crazy on the door of his house. He had to beat the door down. But more, finally, he, Ed got almost back to his truck, and then he said, hey! So then he came back, and he said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm brewing beer. Mort uh, is a home brew guy. He loves to make beer. And uh, yeah, so Ed tried to phone him. He couldn't get an answer for me either. But I was running on a tight schedule. I had a, I'm trying to... <laughs> Maneuver everybody into in the position. Yeah. They went there. She started talking about her son George. Yeah. And she said, "Oh, this is my son." Yeah. Well, the other casual thing Ed told me that, and I, I thought of myself 
um, with my harness, you know, with I, I mean, not, lots of kids wore harness. I think Stu had a great big harness, don't go for it, but I'm not sure. I didn't talk to his mom, but um, Ed Gates said when his mother went shopping, they'd put a harness on George and she'd have to tie him up at the front of the store before she would go in. They couldn't take him in the store because he was such a terror. Just, you know, uh, I guess you get kids that are like that. And he was one of those kids. <laughs> But it'd been neat to see a book. Uh, I'm sure there's so many more more stories that uh, we will never find out. And, and again, this is why our group is so important. Um, if you don't tell these stories and you don't have Daryl doing what he's doing, um, they're gone. And you just go to your, poof, there it is, you know. We lost Doug Rose last week, Daryl. Yeah. And uh, Daryl was explaining he was asking me if I could work something around Doug and I watched it and I thought yeah it's such a sad story uh, his life what he had to deal with and uh, if he hadn't have told that nobody would have known you know you could have made an attempt to figure it out but you know it's it's really too bad you wouldn't have got there but it's so important to tell stories and, and, and to get somebody that, oh, I don't want to do it. It's, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, you think, when you write down something, you think, oh, well, that's easy. Yeah, it's not that easy because you go, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, right? And uh, you have to kind of give yourself a few lines and then just ad live it, just talk. Just talk like you're talking to the neighbor across the fence. And I mean, you can talk about the other people too if you want, but it always it's always exciting to get other people's opinion because you never know and you find out who you're related to as we found out today <laughs> that that's that's kind of important can i should i tell that story i, I may as well but uh, about us being in mexico at this yes, sir. okay we're just talking about how things happen and how do you figure it happens i don't know we are in mexico my daughter said we're taking the whole everybody in the family we're going up to this uh, table or field to table restaurant way up in the mountains and very exclusive place in Mexico about 40 miles from Cabo and so we get up there and it's like Puchar's Gardens it's just like how the hell could this be here it's just beautiful and they have three settings for food and food will blow your mind it was just unbelievable so we had to, our setting our first our dinner was for 5 30 so everybody's kind of sitting around. You can have beer, and they have a little beer and a winery there and all kinds of things. And my son is having a beer, and he's talking to this guy and this guy's wife. And we're kind of staying back. We didn't want to kind of get involved. There's 14 of us. What are we going to do? And uh, I'm kind of looking at her and didn't say anything. And I find out, I said, who's he? And he says, oh, he's the manager of the, I know him, for the Grizzlies, the hockey team in Victoria. Well, Ron sponsors them, and uh, so he knows them really well. And I'm looking at his wife, and I don't know her. And she's talking about different things, and, and somebody says in the group, how's your dad? Oh, he's not doing that well. He's on oxygen now, and he's got this, and he's got that, and he can't travel. And, and, he, and, he, I, and he said, he, somebody said, well, how old is he now? And uh, she said, oh, he's 84 or 85. Went, okay, and then she's kind of describing a little bit about the guy. And I'm... I'm closer than we are, I look over and I said, that sounds like Bunsi Sangha. Okay paving? I don't know if anybody knows him, right? That sounds like him. She went, her eyeballs almost come out of her head. Oh, don't tell him I told you. I said, is that him? She goes, yeah. How did you know? I said, I don't know. It, what, you, what you described to me was him. For, and I don't know how the hell you did that. So where do you know him from? Well, I said, I had, a, I had a shop on the corner of Myra and Keating, and he had his shop, and I could see up into his office all the time. And he'd work from noon or 11 o'clock till 2 or 1 in the morning, and so did I. But I started earlier than he did. And uh, he was quite the guy, party guy, going to Vegas and all that stuff. And one night I said, the, Ars, or the, Ars, or the Central Science Police said, I'd seen them sitting there. They sat below his office for two hours, and when he came out, they got him for drinking and because he just drove ahead and boom, they got him. So I said, well, you can't do that. That's entrapment. So I went to the police in the morning and I said, you guys, I saw the whole thing. They just dropped the whole thing. That was it. Didn't go any further with it. So 
I said, you can get them other ways. I mean, you can pick them up at the corner or chase them down the street or whatever, but don't sit below his house. It's like sitting over here waiting for you to know. You're, if you're in the liquor store or you're somewhere, then they come out and grab you. Not quite fair. Not, not, not our rules anyways. So, so that is it. Any more questions or are you done with me? Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, well, you can say whatever you like. You, you can tell them that. You don't. You can, you can lie too. I know. Here, have a look at these pictures. 